Go ahead and find your way to Psalm chapter 3. Uh, as you find your way there, um, I want to tell you about the year was 2010, and it was August 5th, and something happened um, on August 5th of 2010 um, in, in a mine in Chile. There were, if you remember, some of you may remember, some of you may not, but there were 33 mi miners got trapped in a mine in Chile. And what had happened, what happened was, is there's this mountain deep down in these copper and gold mines, and they were down there, and um, a massive chunk of rock uh, fell off the side of the mountain and basically just went through the mine and cut off all of their access, uh, their exit points. And these 33 men were trapped in this mine. And um, could you imagine? <laughs> it's like, come on, like... I just, I think that's my worst fear, maybe. It's that or, like, getting stuck at the bottom of the ocean and just ending it there, you know? Like, I don't know. Like, claustrophobia. I think as I'm getting older, I'm getting more claustrophobic. Um, I think is what's happening. One day I climbed, like, underneath this stage to do something, and I was like, I'm going to die under here, you know? I'm going to die. That's what's going to happen. I'm never going to get out. I'm going to get stuck, and they're going to find me next Sunday, you know? And so, but they're, they're, they're stuck in a place, and here's, here's the wild thing, what, got, what, became, um, what came to light was the, the mining company, um, they had, the practices that they had been using were, were not safe, okay? OSHA was not being followed, and which was part of the reason uh, that these miners f found themselves trapped. And can you imagine, uh, one, can you imagine being those miners trapped um, and surrounded on all sides? But can you, be, can you imagine being the CEO, the, the executive board of that company, like now this is a national news story and we're to blame. We're to blame. People's lives are at stake and we're to blame. This is where David finds himself in Psalm chapter 3. This is a problem and an issue and enemies on all sides, and it's his own doing. It's his own doing. And so I'm going to explain this story here in a minute, but what we're going to do right now is we're going to read this text. Psalm chapter 3. If you're there, say word. word. Let's get into the Word so the Word can get into us. Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many say about me, there is no help for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I, I lie down and sleep. I wake and begin, and I, I, wake, I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not be afraid of thousands of people who have taken their stand against me on every side. Rise up, Lord. Save me, my God. You strike all my enemies on their cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Speak to us through this psalm. Speak to us through the situation that David is going through, Lord, and give us wisdom and guidance as we no doubt find ourselves in predicaments facing enemies of issues that we created ourselves. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A little bit about the book of, um, of Psalms. It's, um, it's organized in five books as you read the headings uh, throughout the Psalms. You'll see book one, book two, book three, book four, book five. Um, there's differencing on opinion on um, on this first part, but I think I, I, where I would land is that um, Psalm 1 and 2 are introductory. They're introductions to, um, to the entire book itself, um, uh, Psalms 1 through 150. Um, and then the first book actually starts here at Psalm 3. So, so Psalm 3 is actually the first Psalm. And that should be really comforting to us because... Uh, Right out the gate, a book of songs, and the first psalm is a psalm about, I blew it, and now I'm facing, um, I'm facing the, the, the ramifications of, of my um, really not-so-great actions. 
Right. Been there? You, you ever been there, the CEO of the, of the mining company where, oh, man, the situation that I'm facing, no one's to blame but the man in the mirror. And here's where David finds himself. If you go back and read in 2 Samuel, what you'll find is it's a long story spreads over multiple chapters, but basically it starts from that infamous moment that we all uh, probably are aware of, the, the Bathsheba and David moment where David is not where he should be out with his army, but he's, he's chilling at the crib, just relaxing, and looks out and sees um, uh, the thing that he shouldn't be looking at. Um, and then he takes what is not his. He takes what doesn't belong to him because he has that authority. Um, and it leads to uh, cover up and murder and scandal and all of this. David then um, be, is honest before Nathan and he's like, yes, I'm that. Oh, man, I've really blown it. Um, but here's the deal. God tells him like, um, listen, I forgive you, but the consequences in your life, these issues are never going to leave your household. Like, it's, there's going to be turmoil, and this is exactly what happens. So he has kids and this, and then he has a son, um, Ammon. And, and, and what, just to say this nicely, Ammon's not a great guy, makes a really bad decision similar to his father's decision with his sister. Ammon makes this decision with Tamar. And um, just to keep it PG-13, you can go and read that story yourself. But here's the deal. If you know the story of Bathsheba and David, you know the story of Ammon and Tamar. And what happens is for, for two years, David does nothing. He's upset about it, but he does nothing. And here's the deal. You ask yourself, why wouldn't David do something? It's real hard to slap somebody's hand when it's in the cookie jar when your hand's been in the cookie jar. It's real hard to jump on somebody and tell them they've done wrong when you have done the same thing and so David's other son Absalom takes it on his own he's angry rightfully so and he goes and avenges Tamar and slays his brother and now he's on the run and he's on the run and David is upset he, this is one of his sons and he's passed away now in the whole situation feeling guilt about his own issues and all of that, no doubt. And he, he allows Absalom to come back into the kingdom. He, he gives him amnesty. And so Absalom's no longer on the run. And then he comes back, and for four years, David is operating as king, taking care of all the things that are going on. And Absalom is down at the city gate, and everyone who comes in, he's like, you're going to, you're going to have David judge for you? Ah, just, he's busy. Just let me judge for you. No doubt telling the story of his father and his father's lack of justice when it came to his sister. And over the course of four years, Absalom turns the heart of the people away from David and to himself. So one day Absalom goes out, he, he garners an army, and he begins to march back into Jerusalem, and David hears of it. And David knows it's, there's no contest. And so David gets his closest companions. He keeps two there, and he's like, listen, stay here, and hopefully Absalom won't take you out, and you'll be able to share with me what's going on as I flee. And David and his men slide out of Jerusalem out the back as Absalom and the army come in the front. And David has imagined Psalm and uh, Samuel. It tells us that um, there's this point where it says that David had his head covered and he was barefooted walking up the hill of the Garden of Gethsemane. So, man, this is King David. This is King David. The guy, the guy, slayer of lions and bears and Goliath. Uh, uh, Saul has killed the thousands, David the ten thousands. And here he is barefooted, running out the back of his own city with his head covered. You ever been there? Now I know your situation was different. You weren't king of Israel and all of those things. 
But you ever been barefooted with your hair covered just hoping nobody sees you? Hoping that this situation will just pass. Maybe, I don't know, maybe something will happen and my circumstance will change and I'm not going to have to face the music. It's tough. It's a tough situation that David finds himself in. Then it just gets worse because he's going up. Well, it gets better and worse throughout this thing. Um, and he runs into uh, Mephibosheth's uh, servant. And Mephibosheth's servant, which is Mephibosheth is a uh, descendant of Saul. And, and so he's like, his servant's like, here, I got all this food. And so he gets some, some supplies. So he's like, he's feeling kind of good about it. So it's like, okay, Lord, you're still providing. Uh, I'm barefooted and my head's covered, but you're still providing. Then there's this other guy who's a descendant of Saul. And, and he's just jawing. He sees David coming. And man, he's just getting after him. Get it. David, it's your time. What you did to Saul and his sons, yep, the, uh, it's, it's come to roost on your house today. And David's listening and listening, and one of, his, one of David's boys is like, let me, just, let me go over here and take this guy out, shut him up, you know. And David's like, no, 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 no. The Lord will vindicate me. What he's saying may be true. The Lord may have left my life. And so David goes, and, and at the end of that chapter, it says that, that David and his men get to a place. After hearing all of that, they get to a safe place. And it says the men lay down and rest. And it's in this moment that David writes this psalm. He's laid up, barefooted, head covered, army on the run, and they lay down to take a nap because they're wore out from the day's journey. And then we think about that night as David's laying there, most likely sleepless to some extent. And he pens these words, Lord, how my foes increase. There are many who attack me. Many. There, it's not just that I have an enemy. It's that they're increasing. You ever felt like that? You ever... You ever, as, as, as they would say, you ever had any haters and it just feels like they just keep on hating and they keep on getting more and more to jump on the bandwagon? And, and the thing is, you don't have any ammunition to stand against them because they're right. You did blow it. You did blow it. Here's the thing. David talks about his many enemies and that they're increasing. And my question to you is, have you ever experienced the power of one? Because if you're like me, I don't need many enemies or for them to be increasing. Oftentimes it just takes one to get me in a place where I feel barefooted and head covered. Many say, many say this about me. But often, man, there's just power in one. Oftentimes, if they're actually pointing out brokenness, that, that is absolutely true about our lives, and it becomes really, really challenging to not just hang your head and give up. And he hears them, and they say, there's, there's no help for him in God. There's no, there's no help for him. And here's, first of all, what I want us to understand is the difference between reality and truth. What, what's David's reality? Let me tell you. There are many enemies in David's life at this point. And they are increasing. That's the reality of the matter. But here's what's the problem and where these voices that are telling him there's no help for him in God, they're wrong. There may be no help for him in Ahithophel, which is, they say about Ahithophel, he's an advisor to King David. And now he's slid over to Absalom's side. And this is what they say about Ahithophel. They say his words are like the words of God. And so for David, there may be no help there. There may be no help in the people of 
of Israel because they have turned their back on him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, the reality of the situation is there's no help there. But the truth of the matter is God has not left David. God has not left David. And so here's what I want to tell you, and you've experienced this in your own life. I don't know where you found yourself or where you find yourself in this moment. Whatever the enemy looks like, whether it's one or many, there is oftentimes a voice, and it could be multiple voices outside of you from our culture, and it can be the voice within that is screaming to you, look, look, see, there's no help for you and God. There's no help for you and God. Why are you, why are you trying to follow him and and live right. There's no help for you. It can be many voices. It can be one voice. The temptation is that we listen and heed that voice. And then we justify that by looking out at our circumstance and saying, well, look, all those who have been on my side are no longer on my side. God must not be on my side either. And that is the reality of things. But the truth of the matter, God is on your side. God was on David's side. And so as, as that voice rings up in David's mind, as he lays down barefooted with his head covered, just trying to get some rest, he turns his eyes to the Lord in this moment. And he cries out to the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. Here's the reality. Oftentimes, this keeps coming up in my life. This keeps coming up. We talked about it Wednesday night. I've talked about it with brothers and sisters over this last year, over and over and over. Mature followers of Jesus cry out to the Lord. Their hearts are broken, just like David's. And it can be in this situation about their own brokenness, and it can be about the brokenness that others have brought into their life. But oftentimes the worst thing we can do is just bury that and think and act as if it doesn't matter. David, a man after God's own heart, cries out to the Lord. And mature followers of Jesus know we have a Father in heaven who longs to be with his children and hear them cry out. And so this is what David does. He turns his eyes to the Lord. He cries out. He begins to remember some things. He says, but you, Lord, are a shield around me. This is military talk. And here's the wild thing about this. Like during this time, shields were really small and they would only guard one part of the body. And David says, you're a shield around me. He draws this like picture, this mental picture for us to get in our mind of like a shield that circles, encircles you. He's like, that's what you are for me. Why does David need this? Well, because think about it. The, behind you represents that, that place that you, that's unknown, that you didn't see coming. The thing that you never saw coming, that you haven't dealt with, it's the sneak attack that gets us. Even if, even if the sneak attack is a product of our own doing, like David's, we still don't see it. We're just blind sometimes, aren't we? We get blindsided. And it's not until after the fact that we see that of the things that actually led to the situation that we find ourselves in and the enemies that surround us, the situation that we're in, it's of our own doing, but we didn't see it. Just like David, think about it. For four years, he's in the city just functioning as a king, doing his kingly things. Meanwhile, behind his back, Absalom is down there turning the hearts of the people away from him. And so it's very easy. David could be like, God, you're, you're supposed to be a shield from around me. Where have, you been, where have you been after the last four years? And David is saying, no, you are. The circumstance may look like this, but you're a shield around me. You're protecting me from the known things that are in front of me and the unknown things that are behind me. The unintended consequences of my actions. Anybody ever had that? Had good intentions, but there were unintended consequences that you're now setting in and you're trying to figure out? It's not an easy thing that we find ourselves. Life will do you the sneak attack, the blind side. And where are you turning your eyes at that point? David is giving us in the first song. 
I don't mean Psalm 1. I mean the first Psalm of Book 1. Hey, listen. Here's where humanity finds itself. Broken, messed up, sitting in our own situation, trying to figure out how in the world we're going to get out of this place. And David says, turn your eyes to the Lord. He's a shield around you. And he continues, he says, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. It's my glory. Here's the thing. In the days of kings, here's what it would be said. The people would say, our glory is the king. David's the king. The people are looking at, and, 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 and glory is this, the, the root word is weightiness. It's weighty. It, it, it means value, worth. And the people would scream out, our worth, our glory, our worth and value is in the king. And here David, the king, says, my value and worth is in the Lord. It's not in me being king. Even though Absalom has usurped the throne, I'm over here and my glory is in tact, even though I'm hiding out barefooted with my head covered. My value, my dignity still is in place because the Lord is still reigning. Oftentimes we put too much stock in our own capacity, our own position, our own titles, and so on and so forth. Amen? And David is telling us, man, when that happens, we, <laughs> we find ourselves in some precarious situations. Dealing with our own consequences. And, and it's a reminder for us to turn to the weightiness and the value and the dignity that the Lord puts on us. Not from our title position or the things we've accomplished or what happened yesterday. That's not easy to do. It's, you know, David's got a, 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 a man after God's own heart because, because of this too. He doesn't, he doesn't put his stock and his title and the things that he's accomplished. He puts, he puts his value and his weightiness and the, and, and the reality of his life in, in, in the Lord. It's Yahweh's glory. And because of that, he say, he's able to say, the one who lifts up my head, think about it. Like David has been walking barefooted with his head covered, head down. Shamed. And he says, Yahweh is the one who lifts my head, who lifts my head. He's the lifter of my head. He's the one who will put courage in me, put energy in me when I don't want to get out of the fetal position because I'm broken about this situation and circumstance. When I don't want to walk out of the doors and face the things, uh, face up and own up and walk into the things, like he's the one who lifts my head. He's my encourager. It's the Lord who is my encourager. Since it's such a wonderful thing that Tennessee beat Alabama. <laughs> I was talking to Doug over here just a minute ago. Um, I was talking to uh, about this same scene, and like I was watching a game, like the rest of you, and that that two moments in the game stood out. And we were uh, last night we were at a Halloween party with some friends, and and we were they were talking about he was at the stadium, he was in the stadium, he was telling me about like I was like asking him like what was it like in the stadium, like is this Neyland? Listen, I'm a Bama fan, but I get Neyland's wild. That's that's a fun place to watch a football game, okay? And so, like, I was like, I wanted to hear. I was like, you was in there? Like, you was, man, what was it like? And he was like, dude, he was like, when, ten when Tennessee fumbled that ball and Alabama scooped and scored, he was like, you could hear, how many, how, was it 100,000, we'll just say 100,000 people in the stadium? Was like, you, you could hear 15 years of just like, oh, no, here it goes again. Barefooted, head down, right? Walking up the gut. Here, we've seen this before. We know exactly how this ends, right? And then he said again that happened when, when Alabama was about to kick the field goal and the timeout, and he's like, you could just, uh, just there was like 100,000 people with a uh, of 15 years of built up, like here we go again. And it was almost as if the Lord just reached down and lifted the heads of 100,000 Tennessee fans. And for the rest of the night, they got to party and drag goalposts down to the river. <laughs> That's the picture, man, that David is painting. 
But the deal is, he's in the moment of the scoop and score of the adversary. And in that moment, remember me and we talk about power of the pause? He said, put the brakes on. My head is hung low, but you're the lifter of my head. This is powerful stuff, people. David has an answer for his criticism. He moves on. He says, I cry aloud. Here's the other thing about this lifting up the head. It has like the undertones of a father reaching down to his child. You, if, you have, if you have kids, you know when your kid just comes in, like I, I've never experienced this with JoJo because she's never wrong. She just does whatever she wants. Um, but Eleanor will come in. She's like heartbroken over something she's done. We're still trying to figure out how to give JoJo a conscience. So you could pray for us on that. Um, uh, but Eleanor very much like has that. And so she, there, I mean, she'll just, you know, and like it's, it's that picture where you, the, the father just reaches down. Hey, don't you, don't you dare. You're my daughter. Don't put your head down. You lift your head up. That's what the Lord, that's what David is saying. That's, like, that's how the Lord looks at us like a father to his child. Do not put your head down. You are my child. Lift, lift your head. Lift your head. He's the lifter of our head. And then he, he continues. He says, I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy mountain. This is like just a real easy point. Like only there's only one to seek answers from. And sadly, it takes us to find ourselves in moments like David is at, where we finally are like, okay, Lord, I'll seek you now. When we're looking for answers, which is not just when we're in times of trouble, we always need answers. There's only one person to seek. There's only one to seek. And, and here's what that looks like, just real quickly. Like, here's how the Lord most often speaks to us He speaks to us in prayer by the Deep, inward leanings towards something. You just, it's like, it's not a feeling, it's something deeper than that. As we're praying for God, He just moves us, we just feel his, Him moving us in the Spirit to a certain direction. He speaks to us through His Word. He speaks to us through His Word. He speaks to us through history. We should know church history and our brothers and sisters in Christ who have went before us because here's the deal, like nothing's new under the sun. There's situations that's happened to you that are very similar to situations that's happened to brothers and sisters and we can learn from them in the past. Amen? Let's not forget our history. And lastly, from brothers and sisters in Christ. This is why we, this is why we cry out, not just in silence, but also to our brothers and sisters because as we do that, it becomes aware and God, God from the beginning he chose to partner with humanity to bring about the world that he wanted and wants. And he's not given up on that. It just looks different now. But most often the way God has spoke to me is through others, through you all. I'm praying about something and all of a sudden somebody comes up, we'll have a conversation. I'm like, I see what you did there, Lord. They had no idea, but I see what you did there. He's the only one to seek answers from. And you see verse 3 and 4 right there. Like, he's my shield. He's my glory. He lifts my head. He's the one who answers me. And then he goes, I lie down and sleep. Think about where David's at. Up to this point, he's been sleepless and restless, rolling around. And when he remembers these things, he can calmly lay his head down and go to sleep. Why? Why? As I wake again, because the Lord has sustained me. It's the Lord who sustains me. Here's the truth that we need to understand. Yahweh is at work when you're not. The Lord is at work when you are not. You know daily in the 24-hour period, there's a... There's a time from 6 to 10 hours, depending on how much you get to sleep, where that's a reminder every time. You just give it to the Lord. Like, you just close your eyes, go to sleep, and He keeps you. You don't keep yourself. You don't, I, I mean, like, 
Like, have you ever, like, really sat down and thought about that? What happens when you sleep? It's really, like, scary to think about. That's why we have, like, security systems and we set the alarms and all those things, right? We lock our doors and all that. We lay down and go to sleep. Like, I don't know, I guess I'll wake up tomorrow. <laughs> it's a daily reminder that the Lord sustains us. Like, you don't sustain yourself. You just close your eyes and just kind of die for six, for six hours. Well, some of, some of us like talk in our sleep and do all kinds of craziness. That's a different thing altogether. The Lord sustains me. Like God's at work in the background. When I, don't, when I don't see God working, he's at work in the background. Here's David's story. Here's what's going on. David's up on this mountain, mountain and Ahithophel, that guy who I said, his, his words are like the words of God. Uh, Absalom goes and seeks for advice from Ahithophel. And Ahithophel says, listen, your boy, he's barefooted, head down, he's broken right now. Your dad, go get him. Right now is the time to put David out. You want, you want to be the king? Go get him. It's good advice. However, there's another. Hushai is his name. One of them funny names. Just call him Hush. Shh. All right? And he's one of them ones that stay back because he's on David's team. And for some reason, Absalom goes over to him and is like, hey, what do you think we should do? And he gives advice. He's like, man, your, your dad's a wiry little, you know. You don't want to be messing with David when he's on the run. He's had his back against the wall before. That dude, you, what you need to do, you need to wait this out, make a real good plan, and then go to battle. Meanwhile, he's sliding that information back to David. And guess whose advice Absalom takes? He doesn't take a Hithophel. He takes hush. God working in the background. Gives David time. He sends out the messengers. Tells David, hey, 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 hey. He didn't take a hit of advice. He took mine. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to wait a little bit. Then we'll come out there after you. See, God's at work. You don't know what's happening. You don't know. You can't see it. Well, all you see is that you're with your ragtag bunch, which are, are faithful, good guys who are on your side. But it's just a, a few of you. And you're out there barefooted with your head down, and God's at work for you on, on your behalf. Hey Amen. Anybody ever had God sustain you like that while you were sleeping? He's asleep, and God's at work. There's this old story about, back in the day, organs, um, they had to have air pumped into them. So they would, they would have these big... Um, events where you could come and listen. The, the picture I have in my head, if you've seen uh, The Greatest Showman, where the, they have that show, not the, not the circus show, but the one where the girl sings and like everybody just comes to listen to this one girl sing, is like that, but it's just an organ player. And, and here's what would happen. like The organ would be up there, and then behind the scenes, there would be this person whoo, whoo, like working, pushing this thing down, blowing air into the organ so it could make music. And so this one, one wonderful organ player, he plays... Just, oh, mesmerizes the people, man. He finishes his set. Everybody's, oh, class. He stands up, bows, and he goes back. He goes back, and he looks at the, the, the guy who was there pumping that thing, and he says, man, that was, a, that, was a, that was a great show. And the guy pumping the thing said, yeah, we did. They really loved us, didn't they? And he said, loved us? They didn't love you. They loved me. I'm the one that played. And then they started yelling for an encore. Encore, encore. So he goes back out there. He sits down. Everybody's cheer. No noise. No noise. He goes back, back there. Hey, you got to pump this thing. He said, hey, if you did the first round by yourself, you can do the second round. So he grabbed, he grabbed the man, brought him out there, and said, this is the man who makes it all happen. Don't forget who's playing in the background in our lives. So often we get so focused on what's happening right here, what we can see, man. We lose sight that while we sleep, he sustains us. And that leads David to say, he's able to lay his head down. He's like, I'm not going to be afraid of the thousands of people who have taken their stand against, uh, against me on every side, which is true. 
It's, that's the reality of the situation. And, and David gets to this point in verse 7. He says, rise up, Lord. This is a call back to Numbers chapter 10, verse 35. Here's what would happen. In Israel, um, when they came out of the Exodus and um, uh, God was leading them. You guys remember, they, God would lead them by a pillar of fire um, at night and a pillar of cloud or smoke at, uh, at the day. Uh-huh. And, and God would move, and they had to move as God moved. And every time the pillar of fire or the pillar of smoke or cloud would move, Moses would stand up, and he would say, Rise, Lord! Scatter your enemies. And everybody knew, it's time to pack up and follow the Lord, because we're on the move. And David is calling back to that moment. We're stationary. We're camped out. Rise, Lord, scatter your enemies today. Hey, just a good advice. Start out your day this way. Every day Israel would stand up. They would come out to their tents and they would look. Has the cloud, has the fire moved? If so, rise, Lord, scatter your enemies. What if we begin to start every day like that? Rise up, Lord. Scatter your enemies. We're right behind you. We're going to be covered in the dust of our rabbi. We're going to walk the way of Jesus. Step in step with Jesus. Save me, my God. Save me. You strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Here's the deal. What I don't want to tell you um, is <laughs> to go pray for harm on your enemies. <laughs> I, I mean, David does it like repetitively in the Psalms. Uh, you know, Lord, strike their cheek, break their teeth. That just hurts to even say, doesn't it? Like just your teeth breaking? Ouch. But I heard one guy say it this way. He said, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pray for harm for our enemies. But what we can do is pray that the Lord will just bless them out of our lives. I like that. I like that. You know, some people, we just, we just need to ask the Lord, Lord, we just bless them right out of our life. We just bless them right out of my life. Because there's moments in time, and listen, here's the deal. We're not the judge, so that's why we have to be very careful. You know, start asking God to bring judgment on people. You better be ready to sit in that judgment yourself, right? As followers of Jesus who look back on these stories, we know that. We all, we all are in the seat of we should be judged. We should be judged. Which brings us to verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Not David. It belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be on your people. May your blessing be on your people. This idea of blessing, again, is something we say around here a lot. It's rooted in the presence of God. A person is blessed when they're in the presence of God. So what he's asking is your presence, your blessing in your presence, your favor be with us, with your people. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Here's, what, here's how this story ends. It's really, really tragic. Absalom goes out to battle, and he jumps on his father's mule, which is a, is a half-breed of a horse and a, and a donkey. It's David's war horse. And Absalom takes it for himself. And he rides out to battle. David and his men... And others that join him go out to the battlefield. And Absalom's army is defeated. Many, many men lose their life. And Absalom is on David's mule. Most likely fleeing from the battle. And his hair gets caught up in a tree. And he gets hung up in a tree. It's almost like a cartoon scene, you know. And David's men find him, and they put him to death.
here's what I want us to remember. Absalom went and took for himself the kingship. And he put himself on the king's horse. This is a picture of what we do on a daily basis to our king, Jesus. Mm, Jesus, you're a good king, but I'm better. Scoot over. Let me ride your horse. Let me command the armies of Israel. It's a picture of the garden and choosing the tree. I'm going to choose for myself what's right and wrong. I'm not going to trust what the Lord says. I'm going to sit on the throne. I'm going to be the master of my ship. That whole deal. And sadly, what happens as it happens every time is Absalom winds up hung by his own hair in a tree, caught up in his own scheme. Just like David was caught up in the consequences of a scheme, so was Absalom. We either trust the one who hung on a tree for us or we wind up like Absalom, hanging in a tree by our own hair, by our own demise. And this is what David is saying. Salvation belongs to the Lord and no one else. We can't go seek it and rescue ourselves. When we find ourselves in these moments where we need rescue because of our own problems and our own issues and the circumstances that we find ourselves in because of the man in the mirror, salvation belongs to the Lord. And for us, as we look back on this story, we know that goes through the cross, the tree, a different kind of tree, yes, but it is a tree nonetheless. And we either, we either will be put on that tree and what, what, and what that represents, which is cursing and death and destruction, or we'll allow Jesus to take that from us. And we'll walk with Jesus into new life. Because that's what we were once. We're no longer that anymore. Those Ch Chilean miners. Down there. Two full months. Two full months. And what's wild about it, if you read about it, after, after 17 days, um, they were drilling these like really small holes to try to find and see if they could hear them down there. And they drew, drilled about 30 of them. Finally, 17 days in, they, they hear them. And, and the, the men had made it to what was called the refuge. It was like a place where, um, where there was supplies and things like that in case something similar to this had ever happened. And, and they, were, they were tapping. They were tapping uh, Morse code. And so they were able to discover that they were alive so they continue and they did three different types of drilling to try to get down to them without collapsing the whole thing on them and they they finally they finally were able to get down to them um and what they did they wide they wide they went down with small and small and just widen the hole widen the wide 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 and they finally got it to where one man could fit and here's what happened they put one guy in that and he went down can you imagine 33 guys down there for two months trapped and then all of a sudden, down this hole, comes one man. And you know what that means? One man came down so they could all go up. And that's exactly what happened. Listen, Jesus came down. He came down to be our salvation, to live the life that we couldn't live. Jesus never walked into a self-made trap. He walked into a trap that we made for him. He never had any sin to pay for. Yet he, he died the death of sin. The wages of sin is death and he was put to death for our sin. Betrayed by his closest, by his family, by his friends. Enemy of the state. The superpower of the day didn't want anything to do with him. He took all of that on so that he could be our salvation. So, brothers, sisters, when you find yourself in the problems of this life, 
that you have created for yourself in this instance. Not all of them are the ones that you've created for yourself, but there certainly are those. David says, turn your eyes to the Lord, for he is your salvation. Salvation comes from no one else. And that's the first song. That's good news. Just right out the gate, let's get to it, you know? That's amazing. 